Hello and welcome to the original Grand Canyon Airport. I am currently 20 miles south of the Grand Canyon's south rim here at the historic Red Butte Airfield. Spread out over about 90 acres of Kaibab National Forest land, this property is nearly 100 years old and features many original buildings with a long history of aviation and the Grand Canyon. Let's dive into that today and see what makes this place so special. The story begins just up the road at Grand Canyon National Park, which began life as Grand Canyon National Monument, established in 1908 by President Teddy Roosevelt. Following an act of Congress, Grand Canyon officially became a national park by February 1919. Despite the fact that aviation was still very much in its infancy at this point, the first air tours over the seventh wonder of the world began that same month. However, the infrastructure to support these scenic tour operations was severely limited for nearly the first decade. In 1925, it was legendary photography duo, not some aviation entrepreneurs, the Cole brothers, who opened the first rudimentary airstrip outside the national park boundaries. Ellsworth and Emery Kolb, who had previously constructed a studio on the South Rim, extensively documented and filmed the Grand Canyon and Colorado River in a way never seen before. Their airfield had limited success, and the lack of major air traffic comboed with the creation of competing airfields spelled disaster for the Kolb brothers' aviation dreams. And that leads us here, back to Red Butte. It was at this site in 1927 when former World War I Army pilot turned entrepreneur and promoter by the name of J. Parker Van Zant created a runway in a meadow nine miles south of the National Park. With the help of an airport architect named B. Russell Shaw, who worked as an engineer for the Wright brothers earlier in life, they concocted a plan to build a large airport and airline to service air tour passengers over the canyon. The operation was supported financially by many large investors, which allegedly included Henry Ford, and the Red Butte Aerodrome was soon constructed throughout 1927. The Aerodrome complex included a large hangar building, several smaller cabins and bungalows, a barn and root cellar, and the impressive Red Butte Lodge, which was apparently just as grandiose as the El Tovar Hotel on the South Rim and all of these buildings dotted the land surrounding the runways. Red Butte was state-of-the-art, and often considered one of the best equipped airports in the entire state due to the large financial backing that allowed for no shortcuts to be taken in its planning and building. With the right facilities in place, Van Zant and Shaw created scenic airways that same year. The first flights out of Red Butte carried National Park Service and Fred Harvey Company employees. The first airplane used was a Stinson Detroiter, a single-engined six-seater that shuttled passengers and freight over and around the Grand Canyon. The first paying sightseeing customers took off from Red Butte a few months later in April of 1928. Perhaps the most distinguished guest to ever visit Red Butte also occurred in April 1928. The famed aviator Charles Lindbergh visited Red Butte with two of his backers. Lindbergh had just completed the first solo transatlantic flight 11 months earlier, flying 3,600 miles from New York to Paris on board the Spirit of St. Louis. Lindbergh likely stopped at Red Butte as part of an airmail promotion tour, a celebration of his transatlantic journey, or perhaps out of general curiosity, the reason for his stop is unknown today. By May, Scenic Airways began ramping up tour operations and added more than a dozen AT4 and AT5 trimotors that were purchased from, you guessed it, the Ford Motor Company. That summer, about 500 tour flights were flown. Pilots and passengers alike enjoyed the modern and comfy accommodations of Red Butte. By 1929, Scenic Airways was booming, and Van Zant and Shaw expanded their operations, creating a flight school and a new tiny airport in Phoenix called Sky Harbor. Little did they know at the time that this small airport would go on to become the eighth busiest in the US. However, 
just as things were going so right, things went wrong. The stock market crash of 1929 destroyed Scenic Airways, and by 1930, they were forced to sell off the entire airport property in addition to their 17 aircraft. Red Butte was purchased by Jack Thornburg, who reopened tour operations at the airfield by the summer of 1931 under the newly formed Grand Canyon Airlines. The new company continued to shuttle tourists over the canyon and teamed up with TWA to offer cross-country passengers flying through Winslow the opportunity to fly over the Grand Canyon via the Red Butte airfield. In September 1935, another famous aviator visited the field, this time Amelia Earhart. Earhart spent a few days at Red Butte for unknown reasons where the airfield chief mechanic, Ernest Tissett, worked on her Lockheed Vega aircraft, which would later successfully go on a trip from Honolulu to Oakland. Grand Canyon Airlines continued operating tours until pleasure flying was suspended following the outbreak of World War II. During this time, it is highly likely that Red Butte Aerodrome was used for military training purposes and this is likely because of its state-of-the-art facilities at the time. Another airfield was built in the town of Vail, just a few miles to the southwest, and also used for training. It is possible that Red Butte was closed at some point during the later part of the war before reopening to civilian traffic in 1951, under the ownership of pilots Henry and Palin Hudgen. In 1956, a mid-air collision between two commercial airliners over the Grand Canyon killed 128 people. It was two pilots from Grand Canyon Airlines, still operating out of Red Butte, that first discovered that wreckage, which led to a massive investigation and implementation of new air traffic rules. The FAA was formed just two years later, in no small part because of the Grand Canyon incident. In 1967, the Red Butte Aerodrome was shut down after a new airport was built in Tusayan, seven miles to the north. The newer Grand Canyon Airport serves as a closer launching point for scenic tours over the canyon and is still very active to this day. Meanwhile, the facilities at Red Butte, once state-of-the-art, slowly deteriorated as they fell out of use. And the impressive Red Butte Lodge unfortunately burned down in 1994. The remaining buildings and hangar were used for ranching operations as part of the 10X Ranch until about 2003. The property has changed hands a few times since, but still sits on national forest land, although many of the buildings have no trespassing signs today. The airfield is also on the National Register of Historic Places. Without doubt, the most prominent ruin is that of the old T-shaped hangar, built in 1927. At one point, the hangar had wood-framed rooms that served as offices, a radio room, and a mechanic shop. And while some of those partitions and a few work areas are still visible, they have seen better days. The corrugated sheet metal remains mostly intact and helps keep most of the effects of weather out even today. The large rolling doors look like they could still roll closed today, and it's easy to imagine the busy airport operations that would have taken place during the height of tours here at Red Butte with planes parked inside and out. The exterior of the building still dons the faded lettering of both Scenic Airways and Grand Canyon Airlines Inc. on the front and back of the hangar. The top of the hangar features additional faded lettering, but outside of saying Grand Canyon, it is unclear what the other words were. A small structure remains just north of the hangar, which was likely used as some kind of power generating or control station. A 
corral, likely from more modern times, as well as a barn, remains behind it. Further north along the access road is a small cottage, likely one of the four different cabins dating to the early days that would have been used to house pilots and tourists traveling to and from Red Butte. The outside is in decent shape still with a nice porch and a brick fireplace. The inside appears to be in rougher shape and there are many no trespassing and private property signs hung up outside. A large brick fireplace stands on its own, along with some other debris scattered around, possibly marking the site of the great lodge that once stood here, or perhaps one of the other cabins that were once alongside the airfield. And the root cellar still remains in surprisingly usable shape. From ground level, the old runways that crossed the large meadow in front of the hangar are quite hard to make out. They are easier to see from a bird's eye view, but no planes will likely be landing on them ever again. When first built, Red Butte featured two runways with the longest 8,000 foot runway running northeast southwest across the clearing and leading directly to the hangar which, just for reference, is about as long as the shortest runway at Sky Harbor today. The description of the surface of the runway ranged from sod and grass to a mix of sand, which wouldn't have been a problem for the early propeller planes that landed on it throughout its history. A shorter east-west runway appears to have been constructed around the same time. Later in life, additional runways appear to have been built and a 1964 airport manual shows four different runways in a variety of landing configurations. Today, only the very rough outlines of some of these runways can be made out today, and they are quite overgrown. While Red Butte Airfield today lacks any airplanes or tourists flocking in and out, it remains a testament to a long and fascinating story about the Grand Canyon and how it relates to aviation history. Truly the first of many Grand Canyon airports, many of the nearly 100-year-old buildings remain at Red Butte today. The site can be easily accessed via dirt roads a few miles off of Highway 64 heading towards the South Rim. It is worth a stop and investigation to see the buildings for yourself, especially if you appreciate its long and rich history. That'll be it for this one, so thank you for joining me on this adventure, and as always, I'll see you on the next one.